In this unit, we will study how semioticians have used the theories and ideas of semiotics to evolve the categories for analysis of a text. We will try to understand how the study of semiotics has helped the semioticians understand the processes of communication and how they understand and analyze a text. We have divided this study undertaking in this unit in two parts. We will study some of the semioticians in this unit and some other semioticians in the next unit. We will study only some of the semioticians as they are often discussed a lot in the studies in semiotics. This is not to say that the other semioticians are not important. We will study mainly the basic notions, basic ideas given by Vladimir Propp and Roland Barthes in this unit. This may give us an idea of how the ideas of Sosu were used by Vladimir Propp to analyze the folk tales. This was a basic study which gradually evolved to the structuralist movement. Studying the basic analytical tools proposed by Roland Barth will help us understand how we can use some of the ideas of Sosu to evolve categories for understanding a text, fathoming the various layers of meaning of the text. Now, let's before we actually study the ideas of Vladimir Propp and Roland Barth. Let us try to once understand what is the nature of the semiotic inquiries. As we have seen in earlier units, there has been a long tradition of semioticians mainly in the 20th century after the advent of structuralism as a method or rather a movement in the field of social sciences and humanities. A structuralism as a movement started with the application of Saussurian ideas in the field of linguistics and consequently in other fields of cultural and civilizational inquiries. It proposed that any element under study, any text under study should be studied in the larger framework of the network of other elements in the system. It is exactly like understanding a particular sign in the network of other signs. For understanding such relationships, between various elements of a particular system, semioticians have proposed various models and categories. Thinkers have studied two aspects. First aspect is the relationship between word and meaning, that is sign, signifier and signified in various ways. The other aspect is how to study a text and its meaning or rather meanings by understanding the relationship between the elements of the text and the meaning or meanings created by the active interaction of the reader with the text. In this unit, we will study mainly the categories and methodology proposed by Vladimir Propp and Roland Bach. <coughs> Vladimir Propp represents the Russian tradition and Roland Bach represents the French tradition. There are other important semioticians, but we study these two in order to simplify the job before us. In the field of semiotics, there are different categories proposed by various thinkers suitable to their context of a study for a studying a text. Now, we take up the important Russian semiotician Vladimir Prop, who studied the folk tales of Russia and proposed certain categories for understanding the folk tales. His book is known as Morphology of the Folk Tale. It was published in Russian in original in first half of 20th century, more specifically 1928. First, we will study the thoughts and ideas of Vladimir Prop. Now, in this book, Prop studied some folk tales of Russia and arrived at the conclusion there are, that there are 31 functions in which all the actions in the folk tales can be comprehensively comprehended. Apart from the subject matter, the word morphology as used by Vladimir Prop is itself an interesting innovation by Vladimir Prop. The word morphology till that time and even today would literally mean a study of forms and was used mainly in various branches of sciences. Prop used this term in order to understand the form of a set of folklores from Russia. Prop talked about 31 functions which can be found in the selected folklores which Prop studied. Since then, many other folklorists have established 
that similar functions can be found in many folk tales of other cultures. Thus, the methods of a study proposed by Vladimir Prop is a valid method to understand the communicative content and the basic significative elements or signs in the sequence of events proposed in a particular story of a given folklore. Vladimir Prop suggested some basic functions found across the folk tales he studied. Also, the sequence of functions is mostly identical in the folk tales. This means that most of the folk tales structurally are similar. Each function defined by Prop may be considered to serve as a constant element in folk tales irrespective of the character or characters performing that particular function. So, there is a typological unity in the folk tales even though their themes and narration appear to be different. Most of the folk tales begin with description of identical or similar situations. Then the functions follow the initial situations. For example, in the beginning of a folk tale, we may mostly find a general basic descriptions of members of a family along with the members along with the number of the family members or description of a man who may later on play a lead role with heroic exploits in various situations. Then we may find that one of the members of the family is absent from the situation described and other members may be thinking of him and his return as he may have gone out since long for some work important for the entire family. This function is termed as absence. Similarly, there are other functions in the initial situation which may be described as follows. First, as we have seen, is the absence, where one person described in the situation is missing or subsequently goes missing in the beginning of the story. The second is interdiction. By some narrative mechanism, the hero is warned about some events which are to follow. The third is negation of interdiction. The warning is ignored. <clears throat> the warning as present as given in the interdiction is being ignored. So, this is the negation of interdiction. The fourth function is reconnaissance. The villain in the folk tale seeks something or some information. Then the fifth is delivery. The villain gets the desired information. Six is trickery. The villain makes plans to deceive the victim. Seventh is complicity. The victim unknowingly helps the enemy or the villain. The victim does not know that he is falling into the trap of the trickery but falls or is going to fall to the trap laid down by the villain in the sixth function. So, these seven functions are can are used to describe the initial situation in the folk tale. Then the main body of the folk tale begins. In this part, the storyline is further developed to valorize the role of the hero by his choices and actions. The main action of the story start in this part, which is characterized by the following main functions. <coughs> Eighth function, villainy. The villain causes some harm to someone in the family or someone related to the hero. It is the situation in which a member of the family lacks something as per his desires. Next function, ninth mediation. Hero discovers this injury, the lack, the desire, etc. as per the description in the immediately preceding function. Then the tenth is counteraction. Then the hero is approached by someone or somehow gets placed, the hero somehow gets placed in a situation in which the hero chooses to take up a positive action. Now here many actions are possible, but the hero chooses to take up the positive action and this action decides the heroic acts, which defines the hero by his choice of action. The eleventh is departure. Now, hero is either dispatched or decides to leave on a mission. Now, from here, this was the eleventh function. After this function, the storyline enters into a different phase. In this phase, the hero tries to find the solutions to the problems and the mysteries he has to face for accomplishing the tasks undertaken in the mission. 
the exploits of the hero in this section often constitutes an interesting part of the storyline the function in this phase uh, the functions in this phase are as follows the 12th function testing hero is challenged by the agents of villain or by other agents in various circumstances to prove heroic qualities 13th function reaction hero responds to such challenges 14th function is acquisition hero gains certain magical item or magical agent or some kind of magical strength through some items acquired <clears throat> fifth is sorry 15th is guidance hero is somehow guided to reach the desired destination 16th function would be a struggle the struggle or the battle between the hero and the enemy or the villain takes place in this part 17th is branding now here the hero is branded as the princess or any other person in that particular context leaves some mark with something like case or a knife or a ring etc now 18th function be victory the villain or the enemy is defeated 19th is resolution that means initial misfortune or lack is resolved here and the narrative reaches its climax in this function now with this the 19th function the de denouement of the storyline begins and the story often enters in the fourth and the final phase which may sometimes be an optional phase in the storyline not all these phases are present in all these storylines the function in this part are as follows 20th the return hero sets out for home 20th 21st pursuit hero is pursued by some villainous agent 22nd rescue the pursuit ends as the hero is rescued by some agent or by his own efforts so 23rd is the arrival now hero arrives home or in, in another country and remains unrecognized in that country 24th is the claim false hero makes claims for all the tasks accomplished by the hero 25th is the task now difficult task proposed to the hero so that he can prove his heroism and thus the claim of the false hero of the <clears throat> is dismantled 26th solution tasks assigned to the hero is accomplished and thus the hero is recognized in the 27th function known as recognition now 28th is exposure the false hero is now exposed and then the 29th is transfiguration the hero is now given a new appearance now 13th 30th will be the punishment villain is punished the false hero may also be punished here in some or the other way now 31st is the wedding often the last function that hero marries and ascends the throne now as per the studies a prop most of the folk tales studied have these above functions however we have to note that all the functions and sometimes the same functions can have various meanings which may be designed by other functions in other folk tales in the storyline thus reducing the number of functions in that particular folk tale this is known as assimilation of functions in the folk tale we should note here that the functions as enumerated above are not necessarily present in the same order in every folk tale the essential point is the events of the storyline may be understood morphologically according to these functions but not necessarily in the same order we can understand a lot of folk tales across the world on the basis of these functions since these functions help us understand the constitution of the forms of folk tales the study of such functions is in an elaborate manner is aptly titled as morphology of folk tales by vladimir prop the method of studying folk tales as suggested by vladimir prop helps us understand the basic significative element found in folk tales this helps us understand the folk tales in general with the help of functional signs found in the narration of folk tales thus making us understand the structural formation of the folk tales understanding the structural formation of a text is an important aspect of semiotic studies of a text <clears throat> vladimir prop's study of folk tales suggest us a method for such type of semiotic study of folk tales or other kinds of tales found across the world 
Now let us study the concepts of Roland Barthes, who represents, who is representative of the French tradition. He is an important French semiotician who has written many books on understanding the structural formation and use of signs in various types of texts. In this, in his book, Image Music Text, Roland Barthes has written an essay entitled Introduction to the Structural Analysis of Narratives. In this essay, Roland Barthes has undertaken the study of narratives. According to Barthes, narratives are present everywhere, he writes. Narrative is present in a myth, legend, fable, tale, novella, epic, history, tragedy, drama, comedy, mime, painting, stained glass windows, cinema, comics, news item, conversation and everywhere. Moreover, under this almost infinite diversity of forms, narrative is present in every age, in every place, in every society. It begins with the very history of mankind and there was nowhere a society or a people without narrative. Now it is clear that Roland Barthes sees here the presence of narrative in various forms of texts, in painting, in ceramics, in news items and such others as we narrated just now. So in his other book also he has written similar things like for example in Ex Libris he talks about the semiotics in world of wrestling in the brain of Einstein and many such others. In his book S by Z, Rollo Barth has semiotically analyzed the story of an important French writer Honoré de Balzac entitled, the story is entitled, entitled Saracen. Similarly, in many other writings, Rollo Barth has presented his ideas along with detailed exemplification for analyzing and understanding the structure of a text. Barth and his writings are important because he has given illustrations from a variety of fields which all involve sign formation and sign diffusion. His method of textual analysis is strewn around his writings with lots of examples. Some of the basic important books for understanding his method of analysis are Elements of Semiology, Writing Degree Zero and The Pleasure of the Text among many others. Here we will try to understand some of his basic concepts and categories. We will try to understand how Roland Barthes understands the two concepts, one of myth and the other of orders of signification. We have already briefly studied about the notion of orders of signification in the unit 2. There exist two orders of signification, one of denotation and the other of connotation. Denotation is the most commonly understood meaning or meanings which are obvious to the basic sense of the sign in the context of its use. In, it is the first order of signification. In this realm of signification, the meaning is by and large objective. Connotation is the second order of signification. It describes the interaction that occurs when the user of the sign interacts or negotiates the meaning or the meanings of the sign. In this realm, the feelings, the emotions, the values of the culture in which the sign is being used are all important factors for arriving at the meaning or the meanings of the sign. Here the meaning moves towards subjective or, the, or rather towards the intersubjective as it reflects not only the personalized understandings but also the overall cultural values of a society. Now from here for understanding the overall cultural values of the society we can understand the notion of orders of signification and its application to understanding the myth as present in a society. A myth is generally understood as a story by which a particular culture explains or understands some aspect of reality of nature. There, there are primitive myths about life and death, men and gods, etc. as we find in Greece, as we find in India and many other societies. Similarly, there are modern myths which are mostly about issues like masculinity, femininity, success, power and money, science and such others. For Roland Barthes, myth is the way in which a particular culture 
thinks about something. The way in which a particular culture conceptualizes or understands an object of a process. In a myth, there is a chain of related concepts. These concepts mostly exist prior to the myth and the story activates the chain of concepts that constitute the myth. An example of a modern day myth can be a photograph of a policeman, for example. As the, a particular photograph of a policeman may trigger many concepts like police brutality, insensitivity of the state, apathy of people, helplessness of people and such others. All these concepts exist prior to the photo. If the concepts prior to myth are different in a society, the understanding of the myth will be different. The same photograph of the police can signify a helping hand in need, a good Samaritan who helps us when we have lost our way, etc. If the concepts prior to the myth provide such images of the police uniform, another example of myth can be the photo of a child carrying a heavy school bag. Here the myth is that the childhood is a period of naturalness and innocence and freedom and growing up. All this means adapting to the demands of society which implies losing naturalness and freedom. Another aspect is the heaviness of the bag in the same photograph. Even though we are gradually supposed to adapt to the demands of the society with education, it should not be a crushing burden on the child who is anyway not able to live with naturalness and freedom. No myths are universal in culture. There are dominant myths and there are also counter myths. Often subcultures have counter myths. For example, the myths about science may be that one, it enhances man's ability to adapt nature to his needs. It improves the security and the standards of living. It is objective, true and good. And then we can see the counter myths about science as it is evil. You can see that many communities refuse to accept the benefits of scientific innovations like vac vaccination, etc. The second counter myth of science can be that it creates man's distance from nature and creates a lack of understanding of nature. Science is man's selfish, short-sighted pursuit for achieving short-term material aims. We can mostly see in news, documentaries and such other forms of text. They show the counter myths about the object or the concept being presented. In fact, such myth forms the core of the narratives of every society. And in this sense, Rollo Barth understands that various types of narratives have always been present in every age, in every society. While explaining these concepts, Roland Barth has explained an interesting concept of a third way of signifying through symbols. Now the, here the use of symbols is different than the way C.S. Pierce had used it. For Barth, an object becomes a symbol when it acquires a particular meaning through convention and uses which enable it to stand for something else. For example, an elephant in many traditional societies signify wealth. In modern days, having a big car is often a symbol of wealth. So you can read in stories about the prince or the princess being weighed in gold. Now this symbolizes the wealth, power and the status. So symbol is an in, in interesting concept and you can compare how C.S. Pierce has used the same concept and how Rollo Barth uses the same concept. Now let us summarize this unit at the end. In this unit, we have studied about the general application of the ideas of semioticians like Ferdinand and Saussure, which has resulted into major 20th century movement of structuralism. This movement has encompassed the studies in social sciences and various branches of humanism, as well as in the field of natural sciences. We have mainly studied in this unit the Vladimir Propp's understanding of folk tales, and the, some of the important ideas of Roland Barthes, these two, Vladimir Propp and Roland Barthes, represent the Russian and the French traditions respectively. So in a way, while studying these ideas, we have touched upon the two important uh, traditions of semiotics. Thank you.